Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Ming Hui Diao. I'm the PI for the San Jose State University HACUS team. Um, today, we're going to present some of the work that we did in the last few years, and particularly, we'll have two sections for this webinar. I'll start with a demonstration of the overarching method that we use to generate PM 2.5 and what are the general methods used in the field, and what are the current situation, are they reliable, are they comparable with each other. And in the second section, uh, Dr. Akula Venkatram from University of California Riverside, he's going to demonstrate how to link satellite data with the downscale model, model simulation. So first of all, I want to thank my co eyes and collaborators Brent Freeman, and Chao is a crew from San Jose State, and our co I Mohammed Al Hamden from USRA, and lastly our co I Akula Venkatram from UC Riverside. So our project is motivated by several uncertainties and difficulties for generating PM 2.5. As you know, the PM 2.5 is among one of the most harmful air pollutants for human health. And there has been ongoing interest to develop reliable methods to generate PM 2.5 concentration. But there are two main challenges. One is that we have a lot of unmonitored locations that are not covered by ground monitors. Second one is it is difficult to get a finer horizontal resolution that will be helpful to improve the health risk assessment and public health tracking. So in our San Jose State team, we aim to develop an efficient system that can actually uh, address these two difficulties. So in generating PM 2.5, we use the NASA MODIS aerosol optical depth. And as you know, the MODIS data is a satellite-based data, so it will provide more coverage geographically especially for all monitor locations that cannot be provided or measured by ground monitors. And second, we use a dispersion model simulation that will be able to derive very fine scale resolution PM 2.5, even at 100 meter scale. And these we call the community scale because that's what people usually worried about in their backyard if they live near major roadways or if they live in an industrial area. So in this field for generating PM 2.5, this is um, not just one method that serves all the purpose. We can actually summarize them into four major methods. First one is to just rely on ground-based monitors. For example, you can download the EPA archived monitoring data from the AIR data website. And you can also download the US EPA chemical speciation monitoring network called the CSN data. For a smaller coverage during the wildfire in California, there is the temporary PM 2.5 monitors deployed by the Wildland Fire Air, Air Quality Response Program. And here's also the link for that. So these are the type of data set that only rely on ground monitors. After that, we have a combination of monitor and all sources of data, such as a monitor plus model simulation. The uh, atmospheric chemical transport model, CTMs, can be combined with the monitor. And the fused air quality surface is using downscaling, which is the FHUSD data, can also provide more spatial coverage using the model simulation. There is also the CDC national uh, public health tracking network called the EPHTN. So all of these are actually uh, publicly available data set, the one I mentioned, FHUSD or EPHTN. Moving on to usage of satellite data, ever since we have ability to derive the surface PM 2.5 from the satellite-based data, there has been many studies that use different scale, different methods to combine them. A typical method is to use a linear regression models that can estimate PM2.5 concentrations for remotely sensed aerosol optical depths. The one thing to keep in mind is 
satellite data cannot just provide you exactly what is on the surface. When satellite data sees the aerosol in the air, it is based on the columnal data. So you know what is in the entire column, but you still have to derive based on physical understanding or other correlations for what happens on surface. So you may add meteorological parameters to develop multiple regression models or, general, or generalized additive models. Some of the parameters include temperature, relative humidity, wind field. These are all critical to link the column data to the surface. The last one is probably one of the most comprehensive ones that combines monitor satellite data and model simulation. We have many examples from the um, group uh, that's led by Von Dunkler and Randall Martin. They publish many global data set or regional data set based on this method. So we have actually did a review article just recently in 2019. So this review article is led by me and Tracy Holloway as well as uh, 15 other co-authors. And this was published in Journal of Air and Water Waste Management Association. So in this review article, we gave a table that you can actually see all the details of publicly available PM 2.5 exposure data set. So if you are someone who wants to download the data set for application of public health assessment or other health-related assessment, this is a great start that you can just look at this table and see what is the regional coverage that you're mostly interested in, time period, or spatial resolution. We provided all the details, as well as the link that you can use to directly download them. And in addition to just the coverage and resolution, we also provided on the right-hand side what is the combination, if it's based on monitor, model, or satellite. Now, with that previous table, you probably already have a question. Are all the data the same? Are they very comparable with each other? Or maybe not. So in that review article, we also did a comparison of one year data in 2011. And we are restricted to just comparing that one year because we don't have many years that have overlapping data among all these data sets. So in 2011, we were actually able to get four data sets and combine together uh, for the comparison. So the four data sets include CDC Wonder on the upper left corner. And this CDC Wonder data set is a satellite plus monitor data set. On the upper right corner, we have the tracking network, which is monitor plus monitor, uh, model. On the left, uh, lower left corner, we have the Dalhousie University data. As I said previously, it has monitor, satellite, and model simulation. The last one on the lower right corner, we have EPA monitor air data. And this is monitor only, and people usually use this as a more realistic data because it doesn't have any blended satellite or model simulation that would rely on physical correlations or other uh, regression models. So please note that we have a restriction for use in the EPA monitor. Only if there's all four quarters of the year available, we would use it. That explains why you can see the scattered monitor data and it's not uniformly distributed over the US, and this is on the county average scale. Overall, the CDC Wonder exhibits higher PM2.5 and the larger regional maximum over the central US. And for the Southern California, the tracking network shows much higher PM2.5, over 14 microgram per cubic meter. Dalhousie data exhibit lower PM2.5 overall and is more spatially homogeneous over the Western US. So as you see, they are not always the same, even during the same time. And this is also a figure from the review article that I mentioned to you before. 
So now moving on to some of our Tiger Team analysis. During the wildfire uh, Tiger Team project, we focused on the wildfire in California during 2017. And one of our goal is to see, can we combine the satellite data and the ground monitor data to create a wider spatial coverage for PM2.5 on the surface? Now, on the very left-hand side, you see the EPA AQS PM2.5, and this is all the monitor location. Even though in California, we are blessed with the more monitor coverage compared with many other states in the U.S., but still, you can see this is really not a perfect way to provide every county and every uh, community how the, they are exposed to the PM2.5. In the middle is the NASA MODIS aerosol optical depth data. And even for satellite data, we know there are limitations to retrieve when there is high cloud coverage or if there is a lot of dust in a column. So keep in mind, satellite data still cannot provide 100% of the coverage. Putting them together, we also smooth the data by a uh, surface smoothing model. That smoothing model can provide a graded data just look like the right-hand side, and that is our final data with both satellite and monitor. So to show you some of the usage of this data, we actually already publicly released these data on the SJSU Haycust website. So when you go into the link that I highlighted on the top here, you will see the Haycust homepage for the SJSU team with many different tabs in this blue square. You can select the data tab, and then you will see all the available data set that we have, that we have already generated, such as the daily PM2.5 field that we generated for the entire California from 2006 to 2017. You can directly download using the CSV files, and you do not need any permission from us. We would love to hear if you're interested in using this data set, of course, and if you're interested in using other format, uh, please feel free to contact me and I will be happy to see if we can generate more for you. And the second type is the real-time PM2.5 field for the last seven days. You can download that in that CDF files. And that is definitely a smaller um, data set if you're only interested in recent days. We also have a real-time PM2.5 field that is on much higher resolution for East San Jose, and that is using the dispersion model uh, downscale it to 100 meter. There is another very helpful website that is called the HACUS Wildfire Tiger Team Project website. This, this website was developed by Susan O'Neill, who is the lead of this Tiger Team 2 for wildfire. And I have the highlight of the link in the, uh, in the yellow square here. So inside this website, the SJSU team has shared many data sets specific, specifically for the 2017 California wildfire, including the Mayak plume injection height. You can download the maps, and for, uh, you can also download the tabular data for Terra or Aqua. You can also download the aerosol optical depth maps from the Mayak product. And there's also the data fusion product that combines the MODIS and surface monitors. So lastly, we also have the wind observational analysis using the dispersion model during this wildfire. So overall, these are all the publicly available data set that we have already generated. So to give you a quick intro before I hand over to Banky, uh, this is the one of the core part of our team goal is to provide a fusion of satellite derived PM2.5 and a downscale model. So the idea is PM2.5 from the satellite data can be used to provide a three kilometer surface. And this three kilometer can be further downscaled by a dispersion model into 100-meter scale. 
we have some photo show uh, maps showing here. Uh, when you have the downtown area of Sacramento, initially the satellite data can only see three kilometer scale. But when you run a dispersion model within that three, three kilometer scale, you can see the PM 2.5 distribution due to the high wind, the highway emission. Similarly, we have a case study in the Los Angeles downtown area at the freeway exchange, and we can find what are the communities that communities that are most impacted by these uh, highway uh, ex inter ex interchange. So I will hand over to uh, Banky from UCR, and he is going to show you more work of how to run the dispersion model and how it is linked to the satellite data. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Mengwe. I appreciate uh, the comprehensive talk you gave. Uh, I suppose everyone can hear me. This is Venkatram from University of California, Riverside. And I'm going to focus on one aspect of, uh, of what uh, Mingwei talked about. That's basically using uh, dispersion models to enhance satellite information uh, to get better resolution, both temporal as well as spatial, of PM 2.5. Uh, before I get into my talk, I'd like to thank my uh, uh, co-authors, co Yifang Deng, Isa Cruz, uh, Fr and Frank Friedman, and Frank is from uh, uh, San Jose State, and Yifang and uh, Isa are from UC Riverside. So, the, uh, so what is the motivation for the talk? Mingwe has already provided some uh, background on this. Uh, surface monitors have limited spatial resolution, and uh, remote sensing has got both li limited spatial uh, as well as temporal resolution. You know, you satellites uh, don't give you much more information than perhaps two or three times a day, so they have limited temporal resolution. So we need methods to improve both the spatial and temporal resolution of available information. So what I'm going to do now is uh, show you how dispersion models can be used to improve this uh, spatial and temporal resolution. So before I do that, I'd like to talk about a previous work in this area uh, Gupta et al. did some work on uh, spatial, uh, uh, spatial distribution of PM 2.5 during 2017 fires. He, used, he and his group used satellite data and low-cost air quality monitors to come up with uh, 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 maps in California. And uh, uh, it's, published, uh, it's published, I think, in, uh, uh, I, I don't recall the journal, but I'll be glad to give it to you. Uh, uh, Wu et al. also estimated uh, PM10 and PM2.5 concentrations in Los Angeles during the 2003 fires. I think this is published in Atmospheric Environment. And these provide really detailed maps of PM2.5 using uh, both satellite as well as ground monitors. Uh, both these studies used statistical interpolation techniques. When I say statistical interpolation techniques, they're essentially uh, linear regression models uh, that connect uh, that connect concentrations to other variables like wind speed, temperature, and other variables, and usually they're linear. So we want to improve upon that by using uh, some structure uh, that is embedded in dispersion models. So what I'm going to do is uh, talk to you about how we can uh, do this. Uh, we use dispersion models to capture the structure of fire plumes and available information. I'll show you how that is done. Basically, we assume that dispersion models have the physics in, in, uh, built in them so that they, they remove the structure. And so what is left over after you remove the structure are the residuals. Then you can apply purely statistical models because in principles they're random. And uh, you can do that, and I'll show you how those two can be combined. So this is one way of actually using dispersion models to improve uh, spatial and temporal resolution. So before I, uh, so again, this is uh, providing more details. So the the basic approach is you fit PM 2.5 concentrations at a receptor K using uh, some transport coefficients. 
Uh, and one of the things that comes out of this is actually the estimated emission rates. Then you also fit the AOD to measured concentrations using an empirical AOD model, and I'll show you how that's done. done. Then you combine the dispersion model with the AOD model, and that becomes your uh, combined model. And then what you do is you use the combined model to remove the structure from the observations, and whatever is left over, you can use any spatial interpolation technique. In our case, we use Krieging. And if you're not familiar with Krieging, I'll be glad to answer questions about it. it Krieging is actually named after a South African engineer who used uh, uh, Krieging uh, to, to look at uh, distribution of actually gold veins in South Africa. So, so let, me, uh, let me go proceed and talk to you about the data that we analyzed. <clears throat> These are satellite pictures taken on uh, uh, the day of the fires in 2017. You see a composite uh, satellite pictures. These are actually combinations of uh, several passes during that day uh, uh, from October 8th to October 15th. And uh, what you see here is the smoke plume uh, from, uh, from uh, the fires. The fire actually started on October 8th. Then you see October 9th, most of the smoke is going away into the ocean, uh, Pacific Ocean. And then October 10th, the, star, the smoke starts drifting over the land. And then October 11th, again, much more drifting over the land. And uh, October 12th and October 13th and October 15th, you see the fire going away. So essentially, we are going to look at, so this provides, of course, a visual picture of what happened during the fires. So what happened to the air quality during that time? Let me see what is happening here. Okay, here it is. So, so here, is, <clears throat> here is a summary of what we got from the air quality monitors, surface monitors. If you notice, the 24-hour average concentrations range from 11, 11 micrograms per meter cubed uh, to about 49 micrograms per meter cubed. And then on October 15th, when the fires uh, died down, it was 16 micrograms per meter cube. So this is an average over all monitors. So the, the concentrations themselves were as high as 200 micrograms per meter cube at some of the stations close to the fires. So there were several fires uh, that are named here, Atlas, Nuns, Pocket, Redwood, Tubbs. And what you see on the, on the map on the left are the, are the, are the AQMS monitors that recorded these concentrations. So the concentrations were very, very high. On October 10th, it was 55 micrograms per meter cubed average over all the monitors, and the standard deviation was 43 micrograms. So, so this is the next, uh, next slide gives you a visual picture of what happened. <clears throat> so October 8th, the concentrations were less than 50 micrograms per meter cubed on most stations. I think the standard is about 35 micrograms per meter cubed. It was uh, presumably much less than that. And then October 13th, it shot up. The concentrations were very high, uh, reaching as much as 200 micrograms per meter cubed uh, close to the fires. So this is a visual picture of surface monitors. In principle, you could use the surface monitors uh, to interpolate uh, the concentrations and come up with a map. So what we did was actually use a dispersion model so there were two dispersion models that we used. One was a segmented plume model, and then the other one was a Lagrangian backward trajectory model. And these are essentially dispersion models. They do not have any chemistry. They simply uh, uh, take uh, the emissions of PM2.5, which is primary PM2.5 emissions from the fires, and uh, calculate the dispersion of, these, uh, of, the, uh, of the material that is emitted. And the wind speed and direction was, came from the HRR model, which is the high resolution rapid, uh, rapid uh, I think, uh, response or whatever it is called, a model at 80 meters. Uh, I think that uh, rapid refresh, if I missed, I'm not mistaken. The wind speed and direction at 80 meters. And so what we do is we, uh, we compute trajectories uh, Proceeding from the from the fires, these are the forward trajectories, uh, and, we, and we construct something called a segmented plume model, which I'll describe in the next few slides. 
and then a Lagrangian backward trajectory model. The reason we used two models, we wanted to find out what the sensitivity of the results were to the dispersion uh, model assumptions. So, uh, okay, here is the segmented plume model. It's like a regular um, a plume model, except that what we do is we try to <clears throat> account for the fact that the trajectories are not straight lines. So we shoot out the trajectories, uh, compute a mean trajectory. I don't want to get into the details here, uh, but we try to account for the fact that these trajectories can go all over the place and there's no straight line trajectory. And um, again, the concentrations are uh, predicted using uh, the equation right at the top. Uh, the unknown here, the way, most important thing is the unknown here is the emission rate from these fires. So what? So if you notice, E stands for the uh, emission rate. <clears throat> Let me see, that's the emission rate. And this is the unknown. So when you do the fitting of the observed concentrations of the, to the predicted concentrations, Tj is predicted by the dispersion model, and this is the unknown. So, so out of this fitting procedure, <clears throat> we get uh, the, the emissions from the fires, the estimated emissions, and the model assumes that the particles are well mixed over the boundary layer height h, and the total horizontal spread consists of, stand, of the standard deviation of the horizontal distances. I don't want to get into the details because I don't have the uh, time here, but essentially, it, it's a, there's a mean trajectory which is then straightened out in the dispersion model. So the second model we used, I'm trying to change the slide here. Okay, the second model was the Lagrangian backward trajectory model, which is uh, we go from the receptor to the, uh, to, the, uh, to, uh, to the source. So each backward trajectory is extended uh, in time for 12 hours using uh, quarter, quarter hour time steps. And the transport coefficient is computed assuming an emission rate of one gram per meter squared over the area of interest. Again, I don't want to go into details, but essentially it's a backward trajectory model. Instead of going forward, we go backward. Again, we fit the model to the data. And uh, let me see. Uh, okay, uh, so here are the fits. I think this is very important. <clears throat> so what you're seeing here is the measured concentration against the predicted concentration. And the fit is over all the concentrations measured over all the days of the fires. So what you find is uh, uh, before the fires, uh, the concentrations are low as you expect. And during the fires, the concentrations are high. <clears throat> and this is a reasonable fit where we explain 70% of the variance of the observations. And both the Plume model and the Lagrangian model do reasonably well in the sense that we do get estimates of the emission rates from the fires. So again, <clears throat> when we fit the model, what we, are, what we are getting out of the fitting is the emission rates. So here is a time series of the fitted and uh, observed concentrations. And the model does a reasonable job of predicting the time series and receptor three and receptor four are close to the fire, and receptor 21 is far away from the fire. So you find that the concentrations near receptor three and receptor five are fairly high, going as much as 75 micrograms per meter cubed on October 10th. And October 13th, again, it rises uh, to about 50, 60 micrograms per meter cubed. And remember, the standard is 35 micrograms per meter cubed. So, so here is a demonstration of how the model actually predicts uh, the, the observations, and this is important. The model would be useless if it does not explain the variance of the observations. So this is an important slide. <clears throat> this slide shows the inferred emissions. That is, when you do the fitting, you actually get emissions out of the fitting. And what you notice from both the Plume model as the Lagrangian model is that uh, the plume model estimates and the Lagrangian model estimates are much lower than the bottom-up estimates. Notice that the car emission rates from the model is about 4,000 4, tons per day on October 9th, while the bottom-up estimates, these are estimates from the uh, U.S. Forest Service. These are estimated based on the size of the fire, the fuel, and a whole bunch of other factors, but these are estimates uh, from uh, from other uh, models of emissions, and you find that the emissions are substantially higher than what's inferred from the model. 
And that's understandable because what you're seeing in the model is what's entrained into the boundary layer. So most of the fire is actually above the boundary layer. So you don't see that at ground level. So what you see here is concentrations that the model thinks that the ground level concentrations are affected by. So this is an important slide. It shows that if you plug in a bottom-up estimates, you better come up with better good entrainment assumptions. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to predict concentrations very well. So here are the estimates of the emissions on different days. So what you find is uh, on October 8th, it's about 563 tons. The highest emission was about 3,500 tons or about 4,000 tons. The estimates from the Plume model and the Lagrangian model are not that dissimilar, which is encouraging. If they were very different, we would be, we'd be a little worried. And uh, the lower limit and the upper limit basically is the 95% is the, uh, confidence interval. It basically says that you're off by a factor of, by off by about 50%. That's basically the spread of uh, the emission rate. So this model can actually give you even the 95% confidence interval. Uh, so, so having done that, let me see again this. Okay. <clears throat> so now we've got a dispersion model that's been fitted to data. Then how do we use <clears throat> how do we use the um, uh, how do we use the satellite data? So what we did was use the one kilometer result AODs uh, from AAC and fitted it to. Uh, fitted it to the uh, observed PM 2.5 concentrations. And what you find is observed PM 2.5 on the y-axis and the AOD divided by the mixed layer height from the HRR model, uh, because presumably the AOD is a column integrated value. So when you divide it by the mixed layer height, it's a surrogate for the concentration. So we regress one uh, against the other using uh, a power law model, it's not a linear regression, it's a power law model. Uh, so this is a purely empirical model uh, in the sense that we assume that the AOD is some function of the, uh, uh, some function, uh, uh, you know, the, the observed concentration is some function of the AOD. And the fit is reasonable. It's about 60, you explain about 60% of the variance. <clears throat> so what do we do next? So here, here is what happens. So now we will take the observed concentration and regress it on the estimate from the plume model and the AOD model. And then whatever is left over is what we are going to do, uh, use statistical techniques. And if you look at the table here, the plume model explains on October 8, 40% of the variance, on October 9, 41% of the variance. But more importantly, uh, the, the rightmost column is what happens when you include AOD. And uh, as you can see, the improvement is not substantial. It looks like most of the variance is explained by the dispersion model. So if you add uh, the AOD model, it adds a little more to, uh, to the explanation of the variance. And October 13th is the biggest change. It goes from R squared from 0.61 to 0.66. And October 15th, it goes from 0.33 to 0.39. Um, on October 9th, from 0.41 to 0.59. And so on certain days, it adds a value to the dispersion model. So what we are saying is that satellite data does add information, uh, but the dispersion model can explain most of the variance uh, uh, using ground monitors. So now uh, I'm going to talk about what happens when you, create, when you create maps. So in the leftmost figure, you see pure creaking. That is pure statistical technique. Uh, that is, you don't worry about uh, structure. You simply take the surface observations and use a statistical technique, which is what most people do, by the way. And you get a concentration pattern uh, that is shown in the leftmost uh, figure. In the middle is the combined model. You see a little more structure in the sense that you see the plume heading towards uh, the south. And then you see the differences uh, on the rightmost figure. So what we are basically saying here is that 
The combined model introduces structure into the system. And uh, let me see. Okay, here, here you see the variance of the concentrations. So the pure creating on the leftmost uh, figure, uh, you see a certain variance. In concentration goes from, say, 10 to about 100 micrograms. The combined model goes from 0 to 100, but the structure is very, very different. Uh, the histogram looks very different. Uh, and the differences are fairly substantial. It goes from minus 20 to plus 30 micrograms per meter cubed. So the main point to be made here is that uh, the main the point to be made here is that the dispersion models provide useful descriptions of surface PM 2.5 concentration patterns caused by fires. And by the way, this is one way of combining a model with ground-based monitors and satellite inter information. The AOD model does add some va value, uh, not as much as we thought it would. Uh, and uh, model-based Kraging uh, adds the type of variance that you would not be able to see using purely statistical methods. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to conclude this talk by saying that dispersion models uh, provide uh, a useful tool to improve upon uh, spatial and temporal resolution of ground-based monitoring. Uh, so that concludes my talk. Thank you very much.